And so when I think of my own kids, you know, as Scott is talking about this, what are my hopes for them? And what are my hopes for every single child that we serve? And the first one is that our learners will feel welcome and valued in schools, in classrooms. When I walked in here and that, that first person, you know, welcomed me, when Amy, you know, from the fax team was right at the door waiting for me to welcome me, it made such a difference. It's one of the reasons I tried to welcome as many of you as possible as you walked in, in this morning. And when you go back to your schools and classrooms, I'm going to really challenge you with this. Look at everything like you have never been in your school before. Look at everything like it's your very first day because a bunch of your kids, they're coming in, it's their very first day. And I remember when I first became a principal, I walk into the school, it's like 75 years old, but it's new to me and I'm looking at everything. So I walk in the front office or the front hallway, to my right is a glass office. It's mine, it's gonna be the principal's office. I am so excited about it. And I notice to my left, there's a gymnasium, but above the gymnasium doors is a picture of every single principal who had ever served in that school. And I'm gonna tell you straight up, I watch kids walk in every single day to that school and I never saw a kid look up those pictures and go, huh, that's a principal in 1972? amazing like nobody cares and what I find fascinating is I hear adults say oh these kids are so narcissistic they're posting selfies on Instagram oh my god we used to post portraits of ourselves on walls like that's narcissism so I actually don't say anything about it because I'm new I want to understand the people I'm serving understand the culture but about two months in my secretary came out to me and she said hey George when are you getting the, your portrait for the wall? I'm like, oh no, I'm not going up on the wall. She's like, well, you have to, you're the principal. I'm like, ah, I'm the principal, I can do what I want. That's the beauty of my job. I'm not going up on that wall. So I talked to my staff and I said, look, one of the things I noticed about you, and it's so powerful, and it's something I truly believe, is that you're all here for kids. And we keep saying, we're all about kids, we're all about kids, and then you walk into the school, one of the very first things you notice, it's an adult. That's a very thing, and I think it sets a really bad tone for this, the school, and I, I think those pictures need to go. I couldn't believe it. My staff were like, oh, no, you can't take those pictures down. That is tradition. And one of my favorite quotes ever, it is not mine, is tradition is peer pressure from dead people, okay? Now, <laughs> now, a lot of people, I'm not against tradition, by the way, okay? I have no issues with tradition. In fact, I'm telling stories which is the oldest teaching practice there is in the world. It is used in ancient times. If you are using something in your classroom that was used hundreds of years ago and it works for kids today, keep doing it. I have no issue with that. What I have an issue with is doing stuff just because we've always done it. That's where I start to struggle. So we actually got rid of those pictures and we replaced them. What do you think we put up instead? Kids, because it's the most obvious answer ever. And you know what I watch every day? Kids going, in, oh, I am on the wall. I am on the wall. And I'm not talking kids from yesteryear with their Canadian hockey mullets and all that stuff. I'm talking about kids in the building right now. We'd swap them out every two months or so, and kids saw themselves. And the power of that is that we saw how amazing this was, that what did it do when kids saw themselves on the walls? So what's it gonna do when they see themselves in the literature, when they actually see themselves in the lessons that we teach every single day? And it actually leads to the second one, that we start by focusing on the strengths and passions of each learner. This will shock all of you. I used to get in trouble for talking all the time. I know nobody would believe this. And so I actually thrived in classrooms with the teachers who knew this about me and tapped into it. And I struggled in the classrooms where people tried to make me into something I was never gonna become. And we do this in schools all the time. And I'll give you an example. Response to intervention, multi-tiered support systems. You know those things. I have no issue with that. The approach is sometimes where I struggle. Because what do we do? We get a team together and say, hey, this kid sucks at this, here's how we're gonna fix them. I want you to think if I'm your boss and that's my approach, you would all hate me. And so the first thing we should be saying about our kids, the people we serve, the adults in this space, what is this person really good at? What gets them excited in the morning? How do we tap into that? And it's not about ignoring weaknesses, it's about starting with strengths and how important this is. And this actually leads to the next one. Learners feel their contributions are necessary to the success of the classroom and the school as a whole. One of the very first things I actually did in this room, as I said, get out your phones share to this space Brandon Royzen yellow Brandon where are you right here so I can see Brandon Royzen already sharing to the, this hashtag because I said the room is better when you all contribute instead of saying put your phones away just pay attention to me and you think about when we went to remote learning in so many schools across the world I saw classrooms thrive when kids knew if I don't show up the whole class loses out on what I have to contribute but people are like oh these kids are not showing up and here's the thing a bunch of us did the exact same thing. And I'm not talking about COVID, and I'll prove it. How many of you in this room, when you went to college, did you actually skip a class if you knew you could download the PowerPoint or the notes? How many of you did this? 
12 of you? Are you kidding me? You, listen, I know a bunch of you are lying right now. You don't have to. There's a teacher shortage. It's fine, right? No one's going to fire you because you skipped a class 25 years ago. You'll be fine. And so why did you skip the class? Why did you skip the class? Because the teacher wouldn't even know if you were there. And that's how a lot of kids felt is that nobody knows if I'm here. It's just a constant anyway. And so do we embrace these things for our kids? But it's not just these hopes that we're taking advantage of the changes we had. I grew up with an Apple II C. We thought this is the greatest computer in the world. This is my kids are born into totally fake commercial kid is born and says you know what I can actually cut my own umbilical cord thank you I'm telling you let me google that if you provide me the tools I need I don't even need you this I will snip this off myself great breakfast video and so uh, now okay we know this is fake this is never gonna happen this is a little bit closer because it is a very big day you might want to capture the moment you grab a phone you can even take a selfie the doctor change the filter if you need to do whatever you need to do. So understand this, my kids look at things like iPhones and YouTube the way we look at cars and electricity. It just is, they don't know anything different.